Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on our Azure Virtual Desktop webinar, uh, formerly known as Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop. We're trying some new technology out today, so bear with us. Uh, we also are gonna have a giveaway that you can still be a part of at the end of this. So make sure to stick around to find out uh, how we're giving uh, away some really cool Microsoft Surface Pods, kind of the Microsoft version of uh, the Apple tool. We're here to talk about what we think is a really exciting shift in technology uh, with Microsoft Azure uh, Virtual Desktop. So uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, if you have questions, we'll have time for a Q&A uh, a little bit at the end. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get right into it. We have some uh, live demo stuff we're going to try to do uh, using our demonstration room uh, and some of the equipment that we can show what we've been working on uh, as we build out our Azure Virtual Desktops uh, for your business. always some sort of technical difficulty. You can just click the next button in the window for the PowerPoint. Thank you. So while Azure Virtual Desktops are relatively new technology, uh, the, there was kind of a version one of this that was a year ago, and that's pretty typical for Microsoft's release cycles. What they tend to do is come out and innovate with a new technology, uh, and then uh, they go through a kind of version one of it and then a version two. So. Uh, Windows Virtual Desktops was launched about a year ago, and it had a, a kind of, it was used for bigger businesses, uh, was the focus, people that needed over 200 virtual desktops uh, in, in the middle of their deployment. And so here's some of those larger customers that Microsoft had worked with um, during that first year phase. Bring it on our radar, in the last six months or so, um, when they came out with kind of their ARM enabled, meaning the most recent Azure version of Azure, Azure Resource Manager, uh, version of uh, Windows Virtual Desktops. And that added a few really key features to us. And the one that we were watching for was that in a virtual desktop session, Microsoft Teams and Zoom work. That's been a long time challenge for Microsoft Terminal Services users and other remote users. And the challenge is if the users are remote, they're most likely using Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Zoom throughout their day. So it was really a limiting factor in our opinion uh, until the technology was able to cross over that. We're gonna get to uh, some of those innovations and why we think that that's particularly groundbreaking here in a little bit. So virtualization helps address very specific business needs that we have in the industry. First of all, this is what everybody is uh, worried about. Um, security and making sure data that, uh, that shouldn't leave your environment doesn't leave your environment. Uh, and uh, how Azure Virtual Desktops addresses that is if you want to, you can lock down so no data can pass into or out of uh, that virtual desktop session. So in Microsoft Terminal Services, the end user can, ch can choose to attach local printers, they can choose to attach local drives. And then that's where IT, uh, IT departments and IT companies get a little concerned because connecting a device that maybe we don't know the security of and allowing it to pass data. Well, with Azure Virtual Desktops, you as a, at the server level control that. Inside of the Azure GUI, uh, we control that. The other big security innovation that we have uh, is what's called a reverse VPN. So in order to attach to resources back at your office or even resources in the cloud, uh, when we talk about accessing you know, a server or a desktop, oftentimes we're executing a VPN or we're going to an https.remote.yourcompany.com. And those technologies are fine. A VPN is a fine way to secure your data and encrypts it all uh, and make sure that the conversation between your machine and the corporate network is secure. But that requires IT effort. You have to maintain a firewall. You have to maintain VPN licensing. You have to update firmware. You own that, you manage it. Your internet provider needs to be available. If you are at a remote.yourcompany.com, you're managing an SSL certificate. That's still a Windows server often facing the public uh, that as the bad guys scan your network, uh, they're going to see that that Windows server is there. So if there's a, you know, a vulnerability, say a print server vulnerability like the one that just came out with Microsoft, that's still a Windows server running the print spooler that now has a known vulnerability facing the web. And we do lots of things to protect that. With Azure Virtual Desktops, Microsoft takes care of all of that. 
There is one standard login page, just like portal.office.com gets you to everyone's Office 365 instance. Uh, there is an RD web client that can be accessed from a Chromebook, an iPad, a Windows machine, anywhere. And that will bring you into your virtual desktop. And instead of something that the bad guys can scan, it's Azure reaching out and bringing your session to you. So that's what we call the reverse VPN. The reverse connection technology is actually coming from the cloud to you uh, versus you going out to it, which seems like a small distinction. But what it means to you and your business is it's more secure, the bad guys can't scan it, and now we can lock uh, down access to it. The last force. Uh, we're dealing more and more with workforce shortages. So we need to expand maybe where uh, you find your employees. Uh, and because of that, you may need to staff up in the summer or staff down. Now you can, instead of buying devices and shipping them out to people, you can establish a true BYOD. Maybe you give people a $50 a month stipend or a $100 a month stipend and say, go to Best Buy, get whatever device you want. That's not corporate managed. Go to this website and log into your Azure virtual desktop. And when they're done, you can spin that down. And again, this is all consumption based in Microsoft Azure. So when things are off, you're not being billed for them, which we always think of IT needing to be on all the time and all the time. And Azure Virtual Desktops really represents a change to that mindset. Your employees typically, although we get calls over the weekend, we just had one at 3 a.m. this last weekend, your employees typically are sleeping at 1 or 2 or 3 a.m. Your virtual desktops in Azure could be shut down in that window. Maybe leave one up for that weekend warrior that gets up early or stays up late or maybe even two, uh, but everything else can spin down and then you're not being billed for it in the off hours. That changes the financial dynamics of this offering. It means if you need more powerful machines out of Microsoft Azure, you need graphics enabled machines, you're gonna be able to use those because you're not running them 24 seven, 365 and the price point is gonna be a very unique. Oop, clicker started working, that's great. Specific employees, maybe you have uh, particular workers, teleworkers, you know, we have one client that everyone uh, who does their calling for them works from thin clients. And so it's a great opportunity for a specific use case to use those folks, uh, as well as specialized workloads. Uh, again, that graphics enabled that engineering workload uh, that's been so hard. Our engineering clients need to do civil and structural and architecture and design and interior design. You use CAD, AutoCAD, Revit, those applications need to access really large sets of data. And we in IT have spent a lot of time trying to big, bring large data to your device and then secure it because we can't get graphics enabled virtual desktops at the price point that you is really what your business wants. So your employees can work from any device, whether it happens a graphics card or not, and get that graphics horsepower from the cloud. You can do that now with Azure virtual desktops at a price point that's competitive. So Azure Virtual Desktops delivers a Windows 10 experience. And it's the first, the big announcement inside of Windows Virtual Desktop here is the announcement of Windows 10 multi-session. So 20 years ago, go back in time, we invented Windows Terminal Services. And the Server 2000, we get a terminal server, just maybe words you've heard or you've spoken if you're an IT professional on this call. Terminal Server is a 20-year-old technology. And it's really Windows Server emulating allowing multiple people to access the same server at the same time. So we can take big servers and then divide them up into little chunks and let people access those individual chunks. People really like that. Then we had to build remote desktop services, which is terminal servers, bigger brother, where then we had clusters of those servers and people got you, know, if you had hundred employees, it would load balance you across each of those. Again, underneath the hood, it's still one, two, three, four, five, Windows servers that you're ultimately taking care of. And it's a little bit different. There are rules about some software that work on terminal services, other software that doesn't work in terminal services. There's things like your OneDrive experience that don't work very well, unless we work really hard to use FX logics or other third-party applications to manage OneDrive in a multi-tenant session environment. Well, Microsoft went back behind the hood and came up with Windows 10 multi-session, which is a true Windows 10 instance that your software vendors can't tell the difference between Windows 10 multi-session and regular Windows 10, obviously soon to be Windows 11, as well as you can run Windows 7. We're gonna talk about that later, the ability to go back and still use older operating systems and maintain support from Microsoft. But it's true Windows 10, but you can have one, two, three, four, five, 10, 15 people share one instance. Again, that helps your economics. That's what makes this a change. It's supposed to have a fundamental change in technology 
but it's also a change in the dynamics of the financials around this. And it's all as a service in Microsoft's cloud. And it's native to Office 365. Microsoft made Windows 10 multi-session knowing that every user would use Office 365 with it. So OneDrive works. Your Outlook profile stays with you and can cache even if you've got a user that has a really large Outlook inbox that you should all clean up. So again, this is the only true multi-session Windows 10 experience. Uh, and like I talked about in a minute, you can actually go back to Windows 7 with this technology. And when you're running Windows 7 or Server 2008 R2, if you're running it in Microsoft Azure, they still get security updates. We've talked all the time about how Windows 7 is dead and you need to get it out of your environment. And it's true. And we've said that because you needed to get, uh, you need to be on operating systems that are getting security patches. And the only place Microsoft is still doing security patches is in Azure. So if you take a Windows 7 instance or a Server 2008 R2 instance and run that in Microsoft's public cloud, then it's gonna to continue to get security updates. It knows it's home and Microsoft is still developing security patches, not features, right? I still suggest you be running Windows 10. But let's say you have a specific use case, a legacy application. The only reason your business still has servers running in a closet is because you still have that one application that still needs Windows 7 because that application went out of business and the vendor went out of business, but you still need it for some critical part of your business. Well, now if you remove that with a Windows virtual desktop experience, you can still access it. It can still maintain security updates. It can be secure. And when it's done, we shut it down and you get stopped being billed. This really represents for a small business owner, your ability to get that network closet down to a firewall, a switch and a wireless access point. You don't need any other IT equipment uh, inside of uh, inside your network closet. Now it's a change. Your user's login experience will be different. And we're going to demonstrate that here in a little bit. Again, this is all built in with the optimizations of Microsoft 365. So things like Intune and OneDrive all work seamlessly with the solution. And the client endpoint, we have some clients that we're going to demo here. The thing you're going to use to get to your screen, your keyboard, your monitor, uh, can vary. It can be a Linux-based thing client. It can be a Windows-based thing client. Like I said, it can be Apple. It can be Chrome OS. Uh, and there's different features uh, with each of those. Uh, it's most feature-rich when it's launching from a native Windows 10 or Windows 10 IoT edition, uh, which is uh, our favorite uh, thing client launching point for Azure Virtual Desktops. And Windows 10 IoT or Windows 10 can join Microsoft Intune, which is a part of your Microsoft 365 subscription, or you can upgrade your subscription to include it. Intune is the cloud-based tool that lets us manage and control a device no matter where it is in the world. So now we can use Intune to lock down that Windows 10 IoT Think client. So the only thing it can do when a person hits power on is access their Azure Virtual Desktop login. And by using this whole suite of tools, not only can we secure it, uh, but we can make sure your employees don't kind of end around it or make a mistake and end up with desktop confusion. That's the other thing that remote desktop services has caused for a lot of people is they have their desktop that's on their laptop running Teams. And then they log into remote desktop and their files uh, have another desktop. So you can save it to your desktop and that could be two different places. Or team starts barking at you because a call's coming in on your local machine. And then team starts barking at you on your phone and then inside your remote desktop session. And it feels like your world's exploding because someone's trying to call you. All solved with Azure Virtual Desktops because you have one desktop. You're running Teams in one place. It's a good note to talk about Teams as an optimization the reason why Azure Virtual Desktops we think is ready for prime time is because Microsoft came out with the unique version of Teams that is Azure Virtual Desktop optimized. So it looks like Teams, it acts like Teams. It doesn't have the bleeding edge features, like I'm sure some of you noticed that now it can do real-time transcripts. There's some uh, ability for it to filter out background noise. Those are features that are not yet in the Azure Virtual Desktop optimized version of Teams. They'll come there. They're just on a slightly slower release because they're always vetting each feature for its impact for a completely remote employee, leveraging maybe a thin client, maybe an iPad, and checking it across all of those devices. This a technology is a, is a migra there's a migration path that's already set up. So if you are using remote desktop services today, uh, there is a migration plan and we can help you. Now, if remote desktop services is on site, 
this might mean this is the time that we need to shift your applications that run your business up into Microsoft Azure to sit right alongside your Windows Virtual Desktop instance. Yes, via VPN, uh, Microsoft Azure can talk to stuff that's back on premise. You're going to get the best experience if everything is fully connected uh, and uh, you're leveraging everything inside of Microsoft's cloud. Because so Microsoft then handles all the networking, all the data center, all the cooling, which we're going to talk about here in a bit. So again, this deploys uh, uh, very quickly, uh, unfortunately for our professional services group, but you're still going to need our help. It's all new technology. You're going to need advice about how to best set it up how to set those drain down rules at night, and we can fully manage it. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. What is a levity spin on Azure virtual desktops? The scaling is really important. We can set auto scaling rules that say as your employees log in, it gives them more resources as they log in out, it takes those resources back away. No longer do you have to go, do we have to predict what your workload usage is going to be? Say, I think you need three remote desktop servers. Turns out four would have been a little bit better. Five would have spread it out a little bit more. We can use all use cloud and AI and Microsoft's own data inside their cloud to make decisions to give the right compute and the right resources on demand as you need it. So again, Windows 10 multi-session, enabling Office 365, supporting you know, the newer operating systems and going back to legacy oper operating systems are all advantages you're going to get from Azure Virtual Desktop. It's built on Microsoft's cloud, it's completely standardized. Like I said, the Azure goo, if you will, is handling your login, it's handling your front end security. They're handling networking. They're handling uh, some of the back end security pieces. And you can do this from anywhere in the world. Uh, Azure has uh, instances with available virtual machines in North Central, roughly Chicago area. Uh, in the East Coast, they have multiple facilities, West Coast, South Central, and then around the globe. And you don't need to worry about VPNs. You can have an Azure instance or virtual desktops on the East Coast and virtual desktops on the West Coast, there's no unique networking that needs to be done. There's no cables, there's no MPLS, there's no WAN network you need to figure out. Microsoft delivers that. They manage uh, all of that for you. So again, inside of all that, staying within the Microsoft framework, they also have all the security uh, available to you as well. We can add the Microsoft Azure virtual security stack including their own SIM, their Azure, Azure Log Analyzer, their Azure Security Center, can see and correlate data from your Office 365 and from your Azure Virtual Desktop environment. The other keynote about security is these desktops that you access can be logged into as what's called persistent or pooled or personal or pooled, depending on what you want to use. A pooled desktop means that multiple people actually are sharing the same Windows 10 multi-session instance. But when you're logging in, uh, and when, as we spin those VMs down at night and bring them back in the morning, it's actually coming from an image, a brand new version of Windows 10. So have you ever gotten a new laptop and it has that kind of first day clean feeling, like a new car, it seems to run better, sounds great, feels better on day one. And then every day after that, as you install applications and remove applications, things start to get a little bit more tired over time. Well, not with Azure Virtual Desktops, because every day is probably the first day of that virtual desktop. Now, if you have very specific, uh, one specific user that uses a bunch of specific software, maybe for uh, accounting or finance, they have a check scanner and you just want it to work every time and you don't want to have to reconnect and work on making sure that profile uh, comes up as you log in each time, no problem. You give those power users a personal desktop. And that's where we come in as well as a partner to help you figure those things out. So as we compare a traditional RDS environment to Azure Virtual Desktop, you can see just how much you're able to outsource to us, the partner, and to Microsoft from a management perspective. They're handling a lot of the workload, the data center, the power, the cooling, the redundancy, the internet. You just need internet on your device. Uh, I think increasingly, uh, the cell phones in our pocket, I haven't had my cell phone's internet go down, and that's enough to get to your Azure Virtual Desktop. So this really is a technology that as 5G comes out, uh, even more ubiquitous, which has plenty of bandwidth and plenty of latency for uh, a virtual desktop session, we're going to continue to see and we're going to demo some of those devices uh, here in a minute. So again, before Windows Virtual Desktops, it was the old server, 2000, uh, you know, 2008 to 2019 architecture, and Windows 10 that we had to make copies of or give people dedicated devices. After Virtual Desktop, we're using Windows 10 multi-session to deliver uh, this environment for you. So again, we talked about these optimizations, but just to call them out again, they've optimized for uh, WVD or AVD, uh, the Microsoft Teams experience, the OneDrive experience, 
Outlook experience is all assuming that you're going to use these tools when they develop this technology. Unlike a Citrix, for example, Citrix makes a great VDI solution uh, and is used across a lot of medical companies and devices, but they're going to get their run for a money with Microsoft when it comes to Azure Virtual Desktops because of the native, it's on Microsoft's cloud running Microsoft software, running Microsoft productivity. It starts to come together and the complete picture for a small to medium to enterprise leveraging the Microsoft stack uh, becomes you know, really attractive, I think. Auto scaling, we talked about this already, the ability to, to grow up and down. Uh, and then they renamed it Windows Virtual Desktop to Azure Virtual Desktop, which is why I keep switching the name throughout this whole session to keep you on your toes. But it's because they support Linux. And that's why they wanted to rename it, because it's not just about Windows. In fact, most of the workloads that run in Microsoft Azure are Linux workloads. It's not even Windows that is the number one operating system in the Azure platform. That's because Linux is so efficient. You're using it every day when you access websites, you're on ESPN, you're watching the Home Run Derby last night. That's all running probably off of public cloud, uh, but off of Linux systems because they're brutally efficient at delivering high throughput for the app, cloud-based applications uh, you're used to using every day. So what's a levity's take on Azure Virtual Desktops? How do we help bring this to you? This sounds really cool, but how do we bring this uh, to market for you? First of all, we think device freedom is a big deal, uh, particularly in this new work from home environment, devices are changing. Uh, genuinely, we think that compute is in the palm of your hand. Everyone uses the example, right, of the, your cell phone has more power than you know, what we took to the moon initially, uh, which is true. But it also means that your phone could probably in the future and Microsoft's Duo, their little fold out phone, can plug into a Surface docking station and drive a monitor. So what's the difference between your cell phone and a very small tablet? Not much. Uh, my dad has one of those giant notes because he, you know, big text. I mean, it looks like he's work making dials on a, on a tablet all day long. And tablets can be purchased, a Microsoft Surface Go or Surface Go laptop can be purchased with LTE enabled in them right out of the gate. So we really see that giving people the work from whatever device they want to work from, from anywhere, uh, is really a big deal. Think clients are evolving. Uh, so there's only one vendor, and we're going to show that vendor, and you can see a picture of it here on your screen, that little end computing blue guy uh, over there. Uh, is a Linux-based thin client, it's about that big. Uh, and it's running on a Raspberry Pi, which is a little developer IoT platform, doesn't even have an Intel processor in it. Uh, the other device that you'll see over there is a HP thin workstation. So that's a full 14 or 15 inch laptop, looks like a laptop, acts like a laptop, has an HDMI out, has a camera, does Windows Hello, does all the things that your laptop does, but it's a thin client. It's running Windows 10 IoT edition. You can't run any applications from it other than launching your Azure Virtual Desktop. As long as you have internet, you have access to your device, and that device is not a security risk that your, your IT, IT department or our IT company now needs to manage on an ongoing basis. We at Elevity always strive to distill this technology and bring it to you in a, in a managed way. And so we can fully manage your Azure Virtual Desktop, and it's all a part of our critical four S's, our strategy, security, solutions and support. This is just another solution within the technology world. And it's Levity's job to help do strategy sessions like this, help you decide if this is a good fit for your business in the generation of this tech, where this technology is at. And we're gonna help manage it for you. We're gonna deploy it for you. We're gonna set up all the rules. We're gonna get it connected to your virtual, uh, your Azure Active Directory. We're gonna help you get those Intune and mobile device policies set up to make it work. Because if you deploy this incorrectly, and your users still have access to their local desktop, you're still gonna have desktop confusion. You're still gonna have to put antivirus everywhere. Uh, and so it's, you're not gonna get the benefits. And that's why you leverage a fully managed solution uh, from us. The other option that we have is uh, co-managed. For our larger organizations uh, we, for, that are over hundred users, we can co-manage uh, Azure Virtual Desktops with you. This means that we'll help set up your Azure environment. We'll put it, well, our experts will help you uh, we'll train you on it, engage your team uh, that you have internally on it, and then can hand the keys back over to you, uh, but can still provide monitoring support. Uh, again, this is great in the mid-market space uh, for remote workers, contractors. And then if you're already, even our larger uh, companies that we work with are starting to evaluate whether it's time to take their 10, 20, 50, 100 virtual machines and get out of the data center business and put that in Microsoft's hands. So with that, uh, wanted to uh, appreciate uh, everybody joining today. We're gonna do a little bit of demo here uh, before, we, uh, before we open it up for questions. And so I'm gonna go over here to a Microsoft uh, Surface Go.
So this is the Microsoft Surface Go. Uh, you can see it's a pretty substantially smaller Surface tablet. Um, it folds all the way up. I'm not going to fold it because it's going to go to sleep on us. But you know, a 10-inch tablet like maybe your kid has. And I'm going to duck off screen for one moment and just show in comparison to that device what the laptop is that I use every day. Right? Those are vastly different devices on an airplane uh, to take through and, and get out. Um, and you know, weight-wise, it's a big difference. But ultimately, it's a Surface device, and it's running uh, Windows 10. And because of that, it can plug into the same Surface dock point, this single cable Microsoft Surface dock uh, that my la Surface Laptop 4 uses. And you can see we can go to one of these ultra-wide monitors, which is actually two screens in one. Um, or, uh, and then we can blank out the screen. So you, you have a choice when it is in docked mode that this screen goes black, and you can just focus on your larger. This docking station also supports multiple monitors, up to four monitors off a Surface dock station, two really well, up to four if we're using some USB uh, expansion and things like that. Um, but again, single plug and you're working. Our friend, you know, the Surface mouse, which is all native and built in in Bluetooth. Uh, and you'll see here, oh, I forgot I had booted it up. This is a virtual desktop that I have up. Uh, I forgot that I had already logged into it. And I'll, I'll log out just to show that login experience and how quick it is. Um, so I'm just gonna close out of it here. So this is this actual device. Now we're on uh, our little Surface Go. Surface Go's uh, for the commercial market space are you know, in the four to $800 a unit range, uh, depending if they have LTE and what processor and some of the specs inside of it. If you're in uh, the K through, K through 12 space, they really wanna go after Chromebooks and they get really aggressive with pricing on, on the exact same device. But you don't need a lot of processing power in this little guy because we're just gonna run uh, this. Uh, it's unfortunately, Microsoft's really bad at naming. It's called remote desktop, <laughs> but they don't mean remote desktop. They mean Azure virtual desktop. The client uh, has already logged in uh, for me uh, because it saw my face when I first walked up to it. So Windows Hello is still working. It authenticated me to my desktop. I'm not even typing in any passwords. Uh, it's already logged in. It shows that I have two uh, virtual desktops available to me. Uh, one is the GPU enabled one and one is uh, for uh, the non-GPU enabled. And at this point, I can just double click on it and it's going to connect me to my Azure Virtual Desktop. Nothing unique about it. That was the whole login experience. That was my profile. That was everything else. I, you can see I can run Microsoft Teams. Actually, I have Teams uh, already loaded uh, and I can run it. I can join a meeting from here. Uh, and again, this isn't meeting confusion. And the other important thing to note, look right there, that's the camera. So that's the camera on the front of my Surface Go. That's out in the cloud. There's no lag there, right? So this works. It actually works. You can be on a video session. When I first started pitching this, is I think this is ready to go. I just spent a week working in an Azure Virtual Desktop, joined all my meetings from an Azure Virtual Desktop, and then would kind of play the trick at the end of the at the end of the meeting. I did this all from a virtual desktop the whole time. The other thing is, since this is a graphics-enabled virtual desktop. We've got Autodesk Fusion 360 loaded in here. It's going to take a second to load. Anyone who's worked in Autodesk, you can have a really fast machine on the back end, and this application just takes a while uh, in order to load. Uh, but I'm going to boot it up over here. We're going to play uh, out the oven. We're going to go over to this other side. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the other thing clients that we've had in our test environment as we work on it. And when we get back to this, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do a 3D rendering of, of a bike frame and just show that Azure Virtual Desktops at an economic price point uh, can do graphics-enabled things. So over to here, uh, we wanted to show off that end computing device. So this is uh, the end computing uh, thin client for Azure Virtual Desktops. I'm trying to give a sense of like how small of a device this really is. It's really light. Uh, my boss dropped it the first day that we got it and it survived it. Uh, so it's, it's been battle tested. Uh, hard to see, but these are uh, mini HDMI. So you get little, it comes with little adapters or you order little adapters and it goes mini HDMI to regular HDMI. The only reason it's not regular HDMI is we just couldn't fit it on the side of this. Has one power cable. And then you'll see they did a really good job. It's got a full gig network port and then four USB ports. So this gets you your USB speakerphone, your USB camera. Uh, and your keyboard and mouse. Uh, you can do USB hubs and all that sort of other good stuff to get yourself access to even more. And then there's a little audio out in this guy as well. So this guy, you turn him on in about 10 seconds, you're booted. Just gives you your Azure Virtual Desktop login screen. Again, you log in with Office 365, the same login you're using with Office 365 now. Two-factor works. So if you have two-factor requirements, uh, it'll prompt for two-factor all inside of this Linux thin client. 
little uh, secret in the world, N Computing was the only one that was given the early software development kit for Linux based thin clients using USB webcams. So some of our other thin client partners are waiting uh, to get you know, included in the next round, but this is the only guy that's, that is not running Windows today that is running actual Linux. Uh, so this price point gets really aggressive. You can get these in the $125 range. And that's all you need for a thin client. Dual HDMI monitors, as big as you want them. One running vertical, one running horizontal. Uh, we've tested this out in the lab and it works uh, really well. You can step up from that guy to, this is from one of our partners, uh, Tenzig. Uh, and this is not that much bigger uh, than this guy, uh, more of a mini PC form factor. You'll see you get a few more creature comforts, some more USB ports. Now you get full HDMI or display port on the back uh, and uh, your gig ethernet port. This again can drive multiple monitors uh, and this is running Windows 10 IoT edition. So we're gonna manage it with Intune. Keep Windows 10 IoT edition, you can't install games, you can't install whatever applications you want. So it's a secure footprint still, even though it's got the Windows name in front of it. Uh, but we can manage this device and you can log into your Azure virtual desktop. And again, USB camera, USB speakerphone, uh, all works flawlessly on it. This is the step up within the Tenzig family. So this feels more like the size of a full mini PC. The other thing we've tested, I didn't grab one of those. We have some old uh, HP and Dell mini PCs that have come back from leases. Uh, we can, and you, if you have some of those older machines, instead of buying new thin clients, you can put the Tenzig no client software on it and it will make it into a thin client. Extends the life of the device that you already own. You can already use it. It's already got Windows licensing on it. It already has USB. All those sorts of good things uh, will work uh, right out of the box uh, with the thin client. Or you can buy a brand new one of these. Uh, and these are going to be in the $500 to $1,000 range. They're going to be more like a desktop, but no moving parts in this. Uh, you can manage it all from a cloud-based council uh, that we manage or we can set up for you, uh, which means that you have remote access to it. You can support it no matter where these go in the fleet in the field. And the lifespan on this versus a traditional desktop, these we've seen last seven to 10 years in the field. So you're getting double the economics, even if you're paying the same uh, as a desktop device. So we're gonna head back over and see if uh, our, our friends have loaded over here uh, inside of uh, Autodesk. Again, I'm running on, this has got an ARM processor in it. It's not even a full like uh, i5 or anything remotely like it. Uh, and it's loading and running the, you know, the full Autodesk suite here. Um, so we'll just open up one of their sample files. You see the machine itself uh, is pretty snappy once you get it going, which is what we have going on here. So this is a full 3D rendering of a bike frame. Um, and then we're gonna, we're actually gonna be able to go ahead out of design mode. Uh, and go into the rendering mode uh, just to prove that we're using uh, a full GPU. There's actually an external GPU. Uh, a, uh, in this case, I believe it's, um, pull that guy. The performance tab, what are we using today? It's a Radeon uh, MI25MX GPU. So this is a shared GPU, um, uh, actually from the, the Radeon. They also have NVIDIA ones and, and all sorts of stuff, but uh, you can see that they've uh, this in that split second has actually fully rendered the 3D rendering of uh, this particular bike frame. Um, I can close that out and, uh, you know, this is a 3D model, but I can spin it and you can see it spinning as quickly as I'm moving stuff around. This is across the internet through a very small thin device uh, and it works flawlessly. Uh, graphics enabled along the way. And again, this is just now I'll, I'll disconnect it. But one cable when you're in the Microsoft Surface world didn't even disconnect from my session, still working uh, inside of my little tablet now, little screen, or I can go pack it up. And this little guy is, weighs about a pound, pound and, and maybe a 10th, even you can get it with a nice cute little sleeve. And this is what you can take with you. Go to your meetings, write on it with the stylus, go back to your desk, set it down, plug it in, get your multi-monitor set up. And you know, do we really need to invest in two and $3,000 laptops when this just becomes the endpoint uh, you know, to help run your business. So thanks for joining us. Uh, hopefully you found this content interesting. Hopefully it was all right to kind of bear with us through uh, some of our, you know, initial uh, technical fun that we had going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I want you to throw just the, the PowerPoint in the background. There you go. Video operator. 
getting used to it, but uh, trying new technology across the board today. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, I know we rescheduled this. So for those of you that followed us in our reschedule, we just wanted to do this really well. Uh, and you'll see, we put the, the time and effort to getting stuff set up. We have all of us in the lab, everything that I picked up, even the stuff that was off is configured. Uh, would love to show it to you, provide a uh, demonstration for you. Um, and this is something, if your company's already in Azure a little bit, you've already kind of extended your Active Directory to Azure. Uh, this is something that can be just uh, demonstrated in your environment. We can, we can turn this up uh, in, in pretty short order and you can try logging into an Azure virtual desktop uh, yourself. So uh, thanks for joining us this morning uh, and uh, we'll uh, answer some questions. Sounds like there might be some. Any issues connecting to a uh, user local directory library? Ah, great question, yeah. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the question was uh, any issues connecting to local USB devices. So Paul, you showed off this uh, lovely cute little device with USB ports. Does it actually work? Uh, and it does, particularly on Windows 10 IoT based thing clients is what we found in our testing. When it's Windows 10 IoT and you're plugging in a USB device, it doesn't even come across as a redirected device like you're used to seeing maybe in a remote desktop. It actually comes through as the device itself. So if you have a USB webcam, for example, it's not remote webcam, it's a Logitech C920. It actually passes it all the way through to that virtual desktop. So thumb drives, USB devices, and you know, we sometimes people have weird software that still like needs a USB key to license it. Even that stuff works in Azure Virtual Desktop because it's not remote desktop services, right? You can't plug a USB drive into the back of your remote desktop services server, uh, but you can with Windows 10 multi-session and, and with these logins. So great question. Is that PO, is that PoE capable? That, oh, that's a fun question. Uh, this particular guy is, is not PO. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, is this little guy uh, PoE capable? And he isn't. At this point, he needs a USB-based power, but it is only USB-based power. So he can go to the back of a monitor. Some monitors have USB in them, and it can mount rate and get power off of that so that it's you know one less power cable in your world, but not yet PoE off of this port in particular. Uh, one thing I failed to mention, this little guy is uh, gigabit ethernet inside of him as well as uh, wireless. This is a wireless card in it as well. So you don't even need to plug in the network cable if, uh, if you don't have it near where the station uh, needs to be in particular. FDA 21 CFR part one. Oh, FDA CR part 21, my favorite part of the FDA. No, so the question was, is there, uh, uh, what about compliance uh, with this environment? Uh, and uh, this particular user asked about a very specific uh, compliance framework. Uh, this is what we really enjoy about Azure and our clients that are leveraging it, uh, that are in compliant requirements, is now you can just go to the Azure Compliance Center portal and download all of Microsoft's compliance documents. So if you're an Office 365 user, you're also an Azure user because Office 365 leverages Azure's Active Directory. So you can go into the compliance portal, we can help you get into there and you can download their SOC report, their NIST report, their SSAE 16, all the attestations and all the audits that Microsoft goes through. And what we found is we've done audit support for folks that leverage the, the Microsoft public cloud is your audit support goes a lot faster because once you can prove that you are in the Microsoft stack, and in this case, everything is in public cloud, you know, you've locked down your thin clients, and the only way people can access this is inside of Azure, and you can prove that, your auditors are gonna go big green check. Microsoft's got more security staff than the rest of the United States combined on staff, making sure there isn't a breach within Microsoft solution stack, and you just get to leverage their compliance as yours, instead of having to maybe go through all of your own compliance requirements. I don't know about, I, I don't want to dodge the question about the FDA one specifically, and I, I don't know off the top of my head if that's in their compliance portal, uh, but I know NIST is, I know FISMA is, um, I know, again, SSAE 16 and SOC 2 Type 2 are, are all readily available, HIPAA uh, and their HIPAA high-tech ad, attestation. You know, Microsoft has been uh, a leader. They were the first public cloud provider to be GDPR compliant. You can make sure that your data in Azure only lives in the United States. You can hit a box, to make sure your data never leaves the walls of the US. Uh, and you know they famously got awarded a very large uh, contract with the government. If you're a government entity, they have GovCloud and Azure GovCloud, um, which is specific for where your workloads can run. Again, Microsoft's a leader in compliance and security. That's right. Oh, great.
Perfect. Uh, last reminder is to fill out the form. Thank you for joining us. The form is in the chat. Go check out the link. Uh, fill out the quick uh, survey, and that'll get you entered in for uh, the Surface Pods, uh, which are the you know the Microsoft Surface AirPod version. Would go great with one of those Surface Go's connecting to your Azure Virtual Desktop uh, for your next Teams conference call. So. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, again, uh, maybe one more slide over. It's just my contact information. And again, uh, reach out to anyone at Elevity uh, and ask them to get in touch with us. Your solution architect, your VCIO, your account manager in CSS, any of those folks can uh, funnel you into a great conversation that we'd love to have with you about uh, our virtual desktop uh, experiences uh, here at Elevity and how we think we can help this technology make a difference in the strategy for your business. Thanks for joining us today.